Hey everybody, welcome uh, back to another day of sociology uh, for our next lecture. I uh, hope everybody's doing okay. I just went on a run, <laughs> trying to run more, because I feel if I, got, if I exercise more during this, I won't die of the coronavirus. We'll see if that works. That is my hypothesis. Um, so uh, we're going to ta tackle two really big subjects uh, next, which is um, something called the sociological imagination, and the second one is called the social construction of reality. These are both kind of really important core subjects I'd love to talk about right at the beginning of intro sociology to orient people to the way sociologists think, to sort of challenge and provoke you, uh, and also to kind of tie it into this book that we're going to be reading, The Chalice and the Blade by Rianne Eisler. So if the first part gets a little long, I might chop it up and put it into two separate videos because that's easier to upload to YouTube. The long videos take forever. So, are you ready? Ready for the next subject? Okay. <sighs> Caught my breath. Okay, so we are going to uh, do that. This is something that's in the first chapter of Get In. So I really like kind of tackling this idea of the sociological imagination right at the beginning. Uh, it's created by or thought up of a guy named C. Wright Mills. C. Wright Mills, uh, 1916 to 1962. He's in your textbook. And Mills was an interesting character. Mills is a 20th century American sociologist, uh, grows up in Waco, Texas, goes to school at the University of Texas in Austin. So Austin is like an island. Think about what you think about Texas. Everything else happens in Austin. Austin is like this island. Austin City Limits, South by South Music Festival, which is usually, usually happening right now, but it's been canceled because of the pandemic. Um, keep Portland Weird was actually originally Keep Austin Weird, and we stole it from them. So, uh, so you know, he, he's a kind of, he was kind of a crazy character. He's known as sort of a wild guy and ends up being a sociologist on the faculty at Columbia University in New York City, right there in Manhattan, probably about as Ivy League as you can get and still be in New York City. Um, and he was writing at a time when the world was on the verge of self-destruction. A little bit like it is now, but in a, in a different way. Uh, in the 1950s, we're talking about sort of the 1950s here, uh, the Cold War was really ramping up. The East versus the West, capitalism versus communism, United States versus the Soviet Union. I mean, we were locked. The Berlin Wall had gone up, uh, and there were all these proxy wars happening all over the world, including, you know, a little bit later in Vietnam. Uh, and we were a moment away from nuclear annihilation, World War III. In fact, in 1962, we almost got there because of the Soviet Union trying to put nuclear missiles in Cuba that could strike the United States, and that's about as close as we ever came to complete nuclear annihilation. If you've ever watched the original Twilight Zone program from the late 50s and early 60s, it's all about the mania of living on the verge of complete human annihilation. Makes you wonder what this era will produce. So one of the things, you know, when we think about the 1950s, we don't think about that. We think about, you know, early rock and roll. We think about the move to the suburbs. We think about keeping up with the Joneses and people getting a new car and a new washing machine and all that kind of materialism. Uh, and that's kind of what we associate with the 1950s. So Mills was really interested in, uh, more than interested, felt compelled to try to figure out why aren't people thinking about these important issues? We're about to blow ourselves off the frickin' planet, and people are just sort of excited about getting hula hoops and bubble gum and a new Thunderbird. Um, how can we get people to think about these issues that we sociologists would call macro-level issues? Remember like our last discussion? Instead of focusing on the micro, hey, look, I got something that my neighbor doesn't have. Yay, me. Think about the macro. How do we stop the planet from wiping out the human race? Uh, and so he wrote this piece in the late 1950s called The Sociological Imagination. The Sociological Imagination. Uh, and I'm going to give you the definition of it from his terms. And then I'm going to kind of unpack that and, and, and talk about what it means and how we get there. Okay. So this is how he defines the sociological imagination. And I'll put it up on the screen. <coughs> The sociological imagination enables its possessor, which is going to be you, the sociological imagination enables its possessor to understand the larger historical scenes, the larger his historical scene, so that's the macro that we live in, um, in terms of its meaning for inner life, 
and the external career of a variety of individuals. Basically, that's our micro lives. So we live lives on the micro level, but we want to understand how the macro historical scene impacts the micro. So the sociological imagination enables its possessor to understand the larger historical scene in terms of its meaning for inner life and the external career of a variety of individuals. Basically, he wanted to understand what some sometimes is called false consciousness. Why don't people understand the stuff that's really important to them? Why do they know more about the Kardashians than they know about the Supreme Court? You know, re people seem to uh, be drugged uh, by uh, pop culture and not understand like the you know the stuff that's really impacting their lives so there are kind of three levels that this happened I'm, I'm gonna diagram it I have my five-year-old's whiteboard here so I'm gonna actually diagram this and then I'll stick it up there on the screen um, so these and this is all about this is, so here's the theme this is all about connecting the micro to the macro how do we take the micro level our personal individual lives and connect it to the macro level society. So here's the three ways that this happens. Under, the first one, number one, understand personal troubles as public issues. Understand personal troubles as public issues. We've all got troubles. Nobody knows the troubles I've seen. And they all seem very, you know, micro, personal. This is my struggle. But there's a lot of other people have those problems too. You know, one of the things that we've been talking about that's so depressing is during the pandemic in America, we've seen calls to suicide centers skyrocket. And suicide, we'll talk about suicide. Suicide is very personal, right? To be or not to be. I mean, but we know that it's also a public issue, that there are times when the economy crashes or when there's something like this that's so bleak that uh, those micro level things take on a macro level pattern that there is an increase in suicide uh, when something like this happens. So there are there are public issues around these things. We talk about things like the divorce rate. And when you, if you go through a divorce, I don't recommend it. I don't recommend it. I've done it. It's not too fun. It seems super personal. Like it's all, oh God, you're just all in your head. And But why does America have such a high divorce rate? Why do some professions... Like law enforcement, law, police officers have a 75% divorce rate. 75% of police who are married end up being divorced. You know, so there is some macro level public issue there that's focusing on the personal trouble. So the first one is personal trouble as public issue, micro, macro. The second one is um, biography as history, biography as history. Uh, and this is also the micro macro. We we live uh, individual autobiographies, our stories. I love reading biographies. I'm reading. Oh, I should have brought it up here. Uh, I'm reading a, a, another biography of the jazz great John Coltrane. I love reading about jazz musicians. And you know, you read a story. They were born. They lived. They died. You have this nice linear picture. And it. And we're also living a biography. But we think about those biographies as being a part of a larger history. We are the product of history. I mean, think about how people are going to write about this moment we're in. Writing about the Trump thing, writing about the coronavirus thing. I mean, we're experiencing it as our personal biography, but this is history. And it's going to be written about all kinds of ways. I don't know if it'll be on books, but holograms, maybe. Um, you know, we live in this macro level environment. You know, people always say, oh, I wish I lived in the 60s or I wish I lived in the 1860s. That's usually racist. Uh, or I wish I lived in the, you know, 1840s in Paris with Victor Hugo and the Bohemians. You know, they were thinking that they were in history. You know, the Beatles in 1964 weren't like, yes, this is a great moment in history. They were just like, can we get to the show on time and get paid? Right. They were living their micro level lives. There'll be a couple Beatle references in this class. I have a feeling. Um, so, so both of those are micro macro. Um, and then the idea to to get there, we're still getting towards our diagram. So, personal troubles as public issues, uh, biography as history, and then there are sort of these three questions that he wants us to ask to start thinking about the macro. So remember, the, again, the, uh, the idea again is, let's get people thinking about stuff that matters so we don't have World War III, right? This is where Mills is coming from in the late 1950s. The first question that he wants us to ask is, um, what's the structure of a society? If we wanna get macro, we gotta think about how society is organized. And we'll talk, about, 
a lot about social structure in here, about how, uh, you know, things are ranked. Is it social structure based on money? Is it social structure based on religion, like priestly class? Is it based on gender, which is something that will be a theme in this class? What is the structure of a class? Let's look at it as a kind of a society, a structure of a society. Let's look at it as kind of like a building. And what's the structure to it? So the first is, what's the structure? That gets us to, to macro. The second is, uh, where is that society in its history? So we mentioned last class during the... Uh, Middle Ages of Europe, which were, by the way, called the Dark Ages until the Enlightenment pulled the light switch and turned people on to thinking uh, more rationally. Uh, you know, there was a good thousand years where Europe didn't change very much, right? So where was it in its history? We are going through a huge change right now, not just a demographic change, but a huge technological change. The fact that we can have this class right? Are you there? Can you people see me? I'm in my attic. I'm in my attic teaching uh, a sociology class. This is so weird, right? But we can do this because of this technological revolution. I don't know what happens when the, you know, the cloud collapses and the internet turns off and we all turn into cannibals. But at the moment, uh, we are in this moment in history. We are in this macro moment. Our society is in this sort of transformation. The economy is changing. We'll talk a lot about how the economy is changing too. And the third question that we want to ask, so the first question is, what is the structure of society? The second question is, where is that society in its, his, in its history? The third is, what are the varieties of people in that society? How are people divided? Is it very homogeneous? Everybody is kind of the same, same religion, same hair color, same, you know, dietary styles, or is there a lot of varieties of people? And so, of course, our society is developing more and more of those categories of people. We aren't one people. We are many people. And so what are the kind of ways that societies divide? So the question then is, how do we develop the sociological imagination? How do we do that? Uh, how do we get there? Because, again, World War III. Oh, it's raining again. Man, I timed my run perfectly today. It was like hailing as I was getting in the door. So nice. I love the Portland rain. Um, so to do this, we uh, use something called a fourfold table, and we're going to be doing this a whole ton in this class. And a fourfold table, let me see if I can draw it here on my kid's board. A fourfold table is a table with four folds, and it looks like that. See that? And we're going to be using this a lot. A fourfold table allows us to look at the interaction of two variables or two concepts. So. Um, this is how it worked for him, and I, I, I think you'll appreciate what this is. The first part uh, of this is about awareness of values, and we're going to spend some time in week three when we get into the cultural thing, really get into the issue of values. But for now, let's just say what values are, kind of what we agree are important in a society. Values, we have lots of values. I'm going to write values down here. Can you see that? And yes, you can be aware of your cultural values. I'll give you an example in a second. Or no. This is going to be really messy. My kid was like, use the chalk. Maybe I'll use the chalk next. This is the chalk side. Um, so, so we have a lot of values. For example, we value money. We value privacy. We value individualism. We value freedom. We value... Um, uh, fun. Like we have a culture that really values having a good time. Is this pandemic fun? What about all those college students that went on spring break and then were like, screw the pandemic. This is my spring break. Right. So we might value fun more than we value the public health or the wellness of our fellow folks. I mean, I wonder how many people those people have killed off already. So you can be aware of your values, um, of the shared values of the society or not. So one of the ways you might think about this is like, you know, well, first of all, let's take about the value of privacy, right? Are you aware of how much we value privacy in America? Some people aren't, you know, because we don't spend a lot of time talking about values. But sometimes to make it easier, we could talk about it like issues. So the classic one, this is, you know, still in the news despite all the other drama, abortion. Abortion, hot issue, right? Hot button issue. Some people are very clear on their values. They're pro-life or pro-choice. 
they want to preserve a woman's right to choose, or they think abortion is murder, right? They are very aware of what their values are on that issue. But there's a whole bunch of people that aren't, right? There's a bunch of people that haven't made up their mind. There's a bunch of people that are like, it doesn't, uh, you know, I don't care one way or the other. There's lots of things. I mean, there's plenty of issues, you know, genetically modified organisms. What's your position? Quick. Are you pro-GMO or anti-GMO? Because there's a lot of people that feel very passionately one way or the other about GMOs. But there's a lot of people that, you know, haven't even thought about it. So the idea is that you can be aware of the values or not aware of their values. Okay, so that's that's number one, the values. The other, the other thing, I thought this would be easier, is the notion of a threat to those values. And what else? Um, I might try to find a way uh, to post this on D2L. It's a little bit better than my kid's chalkboard. Is there a threat to those values, yes or no? And a threat can be um, something very personal. I need an opinion from you by the end of this video about what you think of genetically modified organisms. You know, have you ever had somebody poke you in the chest and say, you know, hey, you know, what do you, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Come on, you need to have an opinion. I need to know. Are you for Bernie or are you against Bernie? Like, you know, that that personal micro-level threat. But there, uh, there also can be a macro-level threat that something is going to be taken away from you or something is going to be changed. So, for example, if you value privacy and someone tells you, well, you know, here's something you might not know. Did you know that all the pictures that you post on Facebook, on your profile on Facebook, belong to Facebook, they can do with them whatever they want, right? They can put it in a video or an ad or Pornhub. <laughs> I'm hoping that doesn't happen. But, you know, you, do you own that or does that belong to somebody else? Is your computer, that thing right there, watching you at all time? It could be, right? So uh, that could be a threat. What about the abortion issue? I mean, what's happening across the country is it's getting harder and harder for women to be able to terminate their pregnancies. In some states, it's almost impossible because of these sort of shutdowns in states like Mississippi and Alabama and Ohio. And they just, bah, 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 bah. So there's a threat. There's a threat. So what a fourfold table is going to allow us to do is to look at what happens in each of those situations. And the place that you want to be is where you're aware of your values, but there is no, well, I'm going to, you know, we'll just leave it like this, where there is no, uh, there's no threat. And what Mills called this a state of well-being. I know what I like and everything's chill. Everything is good. Like if I was, um, I don't know what a good example be. It seems like everything is not in, the, in a state of well-being right now. But let's say if I was a capitalist and I had very strong capitalist values, I would think it would be a good time to be a capitalist. There's a lot of support. Uh, there's money coming for small businesses right now to help them through this craziness. And, you know, it might feel a sense of well-being. Um, what if uh, I'm not aware of my values, but there's no threat? Well, he called that just sort of a state of ignorance. You don't know about it, but there's no reason to know about it. There's no reason, you know, maybe you don't know about genetically modified organisms, but no, you know, there's no issue uh, around it. You don't really know, know that there's a threat about it. It seems okay. Okay. When we go up above this line and get to the world of, of you know, where there is a threat, things start to get interesting. Um, Let's say you're not aware of your values. You don't have an opinion about privacy. You're not. You don't have an opinion about abortion. You don't really haven't really thought about your personal freedom. But there is a threat there. It's on the news. They're talking about uh, the lack of abortion access in certain states, or they're talking about uh, net neutrality and you know you losing access to the, you know. There, somebody's talking about. It. There's an old song that goes something's going around. Something's going on here. What it is ain't exactly clear. There's a... Okay. I'll put the link in the... Buffalo Springfield, 1967. Anyway, he called this a state of uneasiness. That you're not aware of your values, but there's... It's an issue. You haven't thought about it. So you're feeling like, oh man, maybe I should figure things out. But this one right here where you're aware of your values and there's a threat, whether it's a micro-level threat, what do you think about this, what do you think about this, or a macro-level threat, the government is going to take this thing away from you. This is crisis. 
Crisis. Can you read that? Crisis. This one right here. That's the important cell. That's the important cell. And that's where Mills would argue people start getting macro. If you have an opinion about abortion, let's just sit with abortion because it's an easy example. And you, your values are uh, the, the right to choose and a woman's right to control her own body. And all of a sudden the government starts saying, hey, we're shutting these abortion clinics down crisis, right? All of a sudden, I care about this and it's important. I'm going to start thinking about how my micro level opinion of this is really plugged into a whole bunch of other people. I'm going to start figuring out where I can sign a petition, what politicians support me, what organizations that I should join. I'm going to start seeing, oh my gosh, this is happening in other states. This is a part of a larger movement against women's reproductive. All of a sudden, I'm plugging into the macro. And so that threat combined with the awareness of values, creates this crisis which allows people to develop the sociological imagination. This is it right here. I'm going to just put SI right there. The sociological imagination. And Mills argued that um, if we can sort of get people to be aware of their values, especially around the notion of, this is World War II, just think about the value of your children and keeping your children alive. If your value is on your stuff, you don't want all your stuff blown up in a nuclear war. If we can get people sort of aware of what their values are and threaten them or allow them to see the threat, then they will develop the sociological imagination and start thinking on a macro level and do something about this problem. They will do something about the threat of nuclear war and try to shut it down. And in fact, in the late 1950s, even before the 60s catch on, there starts to be this anti-nuclear movement uh, to really try to shut down uh, the race towards World War III. Now, why is this important? Obviously, it's not the Cold War anymore. Putin is our friend. <laughs> Or our puppet master. I'm not going to talk about Putin. Yes? Hey, look everybody, it's cozy. I thought I heard you knocking. <laughs> I was knocking. You were knocking. Do you want to hang out with me while I finish up this lecture? Yes! Okay. Because I finished all my math. You finished all your math? Yeah. Okay. That's that's the cause. Cause we might uh you might be a guest lecturer a little bit later. What is on your face? <laughs> You've got all kinds of stuff on your face. Okay. Anyway, so why? So the final point about this perfect timing. The final point. Let me finish up my love. Uh, the final point about this is um why this is important is in sociology. This is what we do. We want to give people the sociological imagination, and the way to do it is to help them become aware of their values. <laughs> And to threaten them, and not in a violent way, in a traumatic, you know, way, but to kind of threaten people to sort of help them, oh God, help them see, uh, help them, you know, to challenge them, to provoke them. So what my, what my job is from this remote location, with my little gnome over there, is to provoke you, to challenge you, especially around some of these big topic issues about race and gender and class, and especially God, right? It's inherently provocative anytime you want to start talking about religion, that my job is to make you feel a little bit uncomfortable uh, and to provoke you, to challenge you, to get you to move to that crisis where you start plugging into the macro level. So awareness of value, awareness of values and threat to those values equal crisis, allowing people to become more macro and develop the sociological imagination. So that's what we're that's what we're going to do in here. Was I'm I'm going to provoke you from my attic. Uh, she's, <laughs> she's already provoking me, uh, and then we will we'll be able to see things in a more macro sociological way. Okay. So the second part of this is a discussion about the sociological imagination. But I have a feeling. Uh, I gotta go take care of a certain five year old. No, me, me go in my little yellow squishy thing. Oh, you wanna go in the yellow squishy thing? Okay, we'll be back in just a little bit.